Hey, hey, everybody, it's great to have you out with us this Friday night. Unfortunately, we can't be at home, but we're so glad you could live stream with us this evening. Friday night, in the Potter's House Footscray Hallelujah. We're going to begin tonight with praising, singing, giving thanks to God. Why are you lift your voice with us? Stand up wherever you are at home. Amen. Let's give God thanks and praise as we give Him the glory, honor that's due His name tonight. Hallelujah. Let's sing that. Clap your hands in this place. Strength will rise. Hallelujah. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong Thanks and praise this evening. Hallelujah. Oh, God, be lifted up, be glorified. Be lifted up in this place, my Lord. Be magnified, Father. Hallelujah. Bless you. We're going to slow things down tonight. He's a God who made all things. Hallelujah. Let's sing it out this evening. You are God. Lord and King, you are Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. You're my help this evening, sing it out. You are my help in times of trouble. You lift me up each time I stumble. You are my Savior and my my Lord, and I will praise, hallelujah, and I will praise you with my lips, yes, I will praise you with my own, and with my hands lifted toward heaven, I'll praise you, Lord, with all my heart. From the top, you are my God. You are my God. You made all things. You are Messiah, Lord and King. You are Jesus Christ, the Son of the Living God. You are my help. Sing it out. You are. I 
Friday evening. We'd love to welcome you out, those live streaming with us. We're looking forward to a great time tonight. What we're going to do first is lift up this time in prayer. I want to pray for those uh, live streaming, also for those who may be first time live streaming with us, uh, those who may be different churches, our different churches live streaming also. We welcome you out. We're looking forward to a great time this evening. Let's also pray, obviously, things going on in the state of Victoria. We want to believe God's hand to continue to move be upon us and upon our state. Hallelujah. We're going to lift these things up in prayer. Why don't we join together as we're all standing tonight. Amen. Father, asking you, God, to move in this place, Lord Jesus. God, have a right of way, Lord, in our midst, my King. Oh, God, that your grace and mercy and your love, your power, my God, would rain down in this state. God, we're also asking, Lord, give us understanding. Give us insight, God. Give us revelation, Father, into your word, my God. We thank you, Lord. Oh, God, you would be revealed, Father, through this study, my King. Help us, I pray. We thank you, Father, for your goodness, your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can find your seats wherever you are this evening. We're looking forward to a great time tonight. Uh, just, just, uh, just a couple of things. Uh, our services this Sunday, obviously live streamed Sunday morning at 10.30 and 6 p.m. in the evening, as well as that our Wednesday our service will be live streamed. Just keep an eye on things. We'll keep you updated with all that's going on. But right now, we want to hand it over to Pastor Elliot as we get started in our home Bible study. Thank you. Amen. Well, there we go. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Stowers and Bailey and for the song uh, service. I want to give a welcome to everybody that's live streaming, uh, everyone from our home Bible studies. I appreciate all our uh, leaders, leaders' uh, wives, assistants, and uh, all those in our Bible study. I can see that there's uh, even people beyond the, in the Footscray Church, so welcome to you. Uh, welcome to Craigie Burn Potter's house. I see that's I've logged on, so uh, welcome to uh, the Spruces there. Uh, just a few things, a few announcements that I wanted to say just before we open the study. Uh, there's also being, the, the chat is open. If you are logged on to your YouTube, you can ask some questions, uh, be a part of that. We want it to be interactive, and so we, we see them. It's only a few seconds delay. Uh, Pastor Stowers is going to be helping me with that. And already there's a, a number of um, uh, best wishes to those that are celebrating birthdays at this time, to uh, uh, Jessica, uh, to Rachel, and to Eddie, I believe. And so a happy birthday to you, and, and glad you're a part of the study uh, with us tonight. Praise God. Um, wanted to let you know, too, uh, as Pastor said, it looks like we're um, uh, back to the past. And so I th feel like I've been at this table before. Uh, last year, so um, we know we're going to be doing live streaming for uh, hopefully only seven days uh, where we're going to have this lockdown. It was very encouraging, only a few cases today. Let's hope that it all just flushes away again. Let's pray that uh, tomorrow and the next day there'll be just fewer and fewer and so that we could see uh, back to normality and back to um, not having a lockdown situation. be very encouraging, so be praying, praying for that. That would be a great blessing. Uh, also, just wanted to let you know from the, looking at this Sunday, so we are live streaming the 10.30 morning worship service and the 6 o'clock evening service. We're not live streaming our adult Bible hour. Uh, so just, you know, so we log on at 20 past 10 on Sunday morning. Uh, basically, we'll, we'll tune in then, you know, have the sound and the, the banner, and then we'll start right on 10.30. And so... Um, so the leader of the Sunday school, um, Sean and Rachel Ewan, have said that the older and middle Sunday school classes are combining uh, at 9.30, and Sean and Rachel will send out information to parents. 
Uh, Jessica Sutton talked about the younger ones. She's going to contact parents about what they're going to do uh, this Sunday as well. So that's from the Sunday school team. Thank you very much, Sunday school team and leadership. Okay, let's look at our Bibles uh, tonight. We're looking at our series, Bold Faith in a Big God. Bold Faith in the Big God. So if you've got your Bible, turn to Exodus 3, 13 and 14. This is going to be our text, and Pastor Stowers is going to uh, get that in a minute for us. But I want to first of all open... This is probably a common experience of a lot of parents with young toddlers. What you'll find is as your young children begin to explore and they're looking at everything and as they're crawling and then walking, one of the common experiences is toddlers see PowerPoints and they want to stick things in PowerPoints. And uh, one, of the, one of the common experiences they've had is children wanting to stick things like forks and knives in PowerPoints. And, you know, as every good parent, you would actually be, you know, saying, hey, listen, um, that's not a good thing to do. Don't do that. Don't touch. Uh, you know, keep away from those things. And so, you know, in the explanation, we don't have to divulge all the insights on the principles of electricity. You know, with our toddler, it's not like saying, well, son, daughter, look, kilometres away, there's a giant turbine that stimulates electrons uh, and there's uh, uh, atom sequences in a way that makes subatomic particles cause electrons to jump and circuits on other, uh, you know, other atoms causing a polar imbalance which leads to a chain reaction which produces what we call electricity. Why the toaster and the oven and the washing machine needs this chain reaction to function. If you and I encounter too much of it directly, it'll overload your synapses, uh, uh, synapses uh, and your central nervous system uh, will possibly cease to function, rendering you dead. No, we don't do that. It's much simpler to say, son, don't do that. Daughter, keep away from that. Don't poke the fork or the knife into the PowerPoint. Don't do that. Because the truth is, they don't have the full capacity to understand. And what we're doing on the whole, we're asking for trust. We're asking for trust. You could say, well, is that lazy parenting or poor parenting? No, I don't think so, because we'd all do that. And if we draw the parallel there with God and us as his children, you say, well, I don't know if I, you know, a child like, like that. I understand a few things, but listen, in comparison with who God is, his infinite mind and his wisdom, the gap between a parent and their toddler, perhaps is the comparison, you know, maybe it's not even a good comparison of the gap between God and us. And sometimes maybe we're not going to fully understand and God is actually saying, I'm asking for your trust on this. And perhaps one day, and truly one day, you will understand why I'm saying or why I'm doing these things. So we're going to look at this study the great I am. And let's read that text, Pastor Stowers. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am sent me to you. What a great scripture. So we're going to be looking at, first of all, in our study tonight, and I'm going to ask a few questions in a moment, but... Who is God? Who is God is our first point. You know, many make many claims about this, but Jesus warns us in Matthew 24, verse 24. Pastor, could you read that? For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So Jesus is saying he uses the word false Christs or false messiahs will arise. So he's warning us about 
uh, these individuals and these people. We understand as we look around at the uh, uh, religious world around us, we see that there are many that claim to be the only true church representing Christ on earth. Can I just make a little uh, comment here? If any group exclusively says we're the only true group or the only true church, run for your life. That's a sure sign that there's problems. Jehovah's Witness do that. Mormons believe that. The Jesus only or the Oneness Pentecostal believe that. Seven-day Adventists, they believe if you worship on Sunday and you're a candidate for the mark of the beast, if not receive the mark of the beast. We understand that even in Catholic doctrine that they believe that they're the one true church representing God on earth. So we see that many say that they're the one true person or one true church uh, representing Christ. And Christ warns us about this. But then there are others that perhaps outside of the umbrella of Christianity that bring into question Christ himself and even his divinity. Many would say, well, you know, Jesus is a good man or he's a, he's a great prophet or he's one of the enlightened gurus or great teachers. But who is the real Christ? If you in one or two words could write down your idea and, and put it on the live stream now, who is the real Christ? Just write a statement to you. Who is the real Christ? I'd like your input. So it's going to take a, a few uh, moments for that to come up. Who is the real Christ? And what's some words to describe him? Amen. So, John 14, verse 6, Pastor, Jesus makes a comment here. Let's look at it. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So this is the words of Jesus himself. And uh, I want you to notice that he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, the, you know, there's, there's a three-point sermon there somewhere, I'm sure. See, no one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is making a big comment. Nobody can come to the Creator, to the Father, to the God of heaven and earth except through Jesus Christ. He is the only mediator between God and man. Again, I love our Catholic friends, but the Pope is not our mediator. The priest does not mediate on our behalf. Christ is our mediator. That's very clear here in the text. So what have we got? Ben says, Jesus of Nazareth. A swapner says, the one who died for our sins. Jed said, the son of the living God, God himself. Well done, Jed. Brian says, the one and only Jesus Christ. Uh, Jackie says, the son of God. Uh, Joshua said, our saviour. Uh, Pastor Stower says the real Messiah or the real Christ. Uh, Pastor Fritz, welcome Pastor Fritz, says the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And isn't that what John the Baptist proclaimed at the Jordan River? Very true. Manal says the resurrected Saviour. I like that, Manal. Well done. James says Redeemer, Saviour and Friend. That's powerful, James. Thank you for that. And so what's some great input there? So who is the real Jesus? Because this is very important. This is ve if through Christ is the only way you, you can get to God and get to heaven, it's critical what we believe about Jesus Christ. Okay. All right. So we, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let's have a look also. Uh, Brittany says, the great I am. I like that because that's actually the title of our study. Thank you for that, Brittany. Okay, John 8, uh, 58 and 59, Pastor. Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Yeah, this is linked to our text in Exodus. Remember Moses said to God, what shall be your name? How should I introduce you to the children of Israel when I go there on your behalf to see them delivered? And God says, I am that I am. 
say that the great I am or I am is sent in. And so now Jesus Christ, when he's talking to the religious people of his day, he says, most assuredly I say, before Abraham was, I am. And they're going, what are you talking about? You're only 30-something years old. You're, you're definitely not that old. Abraham's been dead for, what was it, 1,500, 2,000 years? Long, long time. So you're saying you were pre-existing Abraham. And then he even said, before Abraham was, I am the name of God Almighty. The name of God Almighty. That is very, very powerful. See, these are big claims that Jesus Christ making himself. And we understand that the Old Testament prophesied many verses and many scriptures. I've got one comment saying that in 322 places that there's predictions or prophecies concerning details about Jesus Christ. That he was born in Nazareth that he's of the tribe of Judah, that he's of the lineage of David, that he would enter Jerusalem as a king on a donkey, that he'd be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, and on and on it goes. The prophetic fulfillment of Jesus Christ is astounding in itself. The accuracy of the Old Testament prophecy and the fulfillment to detail. Even his triumphant coming on Palm Sunday and was prophesied even to, I believe, year specific and perhaps even beyond that when it was prophesied about when the Messiah will present himself. So the prophecies in itself are very specific. But beyond that, what's even a greater clincher than fulfilled prophecy is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is the empty tomb, on the Israel tour, we always go to the Garden of Gethsemane. We see the olive trees there. We see the tomb that's been carved out. And do they 100% know it's Jesus' tomb? Maybe, maybe not. But I want to tell you, uh, uh, it's in that very area. And uh, they found this tomb here. And when you go in it, I want to let you know, still to this day, it's empty. And there's a sign as you go back out, through this tomb uh, that says he is risen. And that's so powerful. You know, in a text in 1 Corinthians, as Paul is summing up the power of his resurrection, 15, 3 through 8, Pastor will read it, uh, just talking about his resurrected appearance. Let's go, Pastor. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all he was seen by me also, and by one born out of due time. This is incredible because... Not only is the tomb empty, not only the Romans freaked out with the empty tomb and they could not find any body, not only uh, uh, that, but we see that Jesus appeared for 40 days. Firstly, to the 10 disciples without Thomas and then to the uh, 11, what was it, five, six days later. And then the Bible even says in verse 6, then he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. That's a big crowd, can you say amen? That's a full house. And 500 brethren, and uh, here is uh, Paul saying, then he was seen by James, all the apostles, and then Paul saw him, the resurrected Jesus, on the Damascus road. Uh, Jesus Christ is certainly risen from the dead. And I want to give you a quote here. Christianity has achieved all that it has, considering all the opposition of the Roman Empire and heathen pagan nations, and the reason why it's accomplished uh, so much, and the followers of Jesus went so far and did so much was because Jesus rose from the dead. 
The fact of the resurrection sent the early apostles into all the world with the necessary force to create uh, this wonderful faith that we have in Jesus Christ today. Nothing else could have accomplished this. Nothing beside the resurrected Christ. Who do we serve? Ben said, the resurrected Jesus with three on fire symbols. Well done, Ben. Hallelujah. So we want to then quickly move on then and think about a choice to be made. A choice to be made because what we find going back to our text in Exodus, we find Moses has some questions like us. Why this? Why that? You know, I'm sure in his mind he's thinking as God is appearing to him in the burning bush, he's thinking, God, why? Why did you leave the children of Israel for maybe 400 years in slavery? Why did you allow me to fail when I first tried to deliver the children of Israel and I killed the Egyptian and I, I messed ever, up everything so badly? Now why are you even choosing me to be a mouthpiece for you with all my shortcomings? You know, people can ask lots of questions and sometimes we have some un unresolved questions. Maybe tonight you have some unresolved questions. God, I don't understand. Why? Why did this happen? Sometimes we ponder the thought, why do bad things happen to good people? We, try to, we struggle with that. I'm, I've just finished reading the book of Job and, and I, each time I read it and, and the narrative there is, is incredible and sometimes we see that you know, bad things can happen to good people. But then we ask some bigger questions. What about this person, pastor? Are they in heaven or are they in hell? What about this circumstance? How did, how did this all work out? Can I make a comment about this? You know, I, I, I preach what the Bible says, but I thank God I'm not God. I don't have to choose. It's, it's not, I'm not the judge, ultimately, neither are you and I. Thank God it's God Almighty and his infinite wisdom. Right? We know what the Bible says. We need to repent and believe. We understand that. We need to go and take the good news out. But, you know, many times there's, there's questions about this individual situation, that person. And I say, you know what? I don't have to make that call. God makes that call. I preach what the word of God says. But God makes the call. So there can be unanswered questions. And we perhaps see that Moses is maybe like you and I sometimes full of questions. Even at this moment, he turns aside to see the great side of the burning bush. And then as he comes closer, God begins to speak to him. God begins to re reveal himself. Let's read our text again, verse 13 and 14, Exodus 2, uh, 3, Pastor Stowers. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I want to ask the question and throw it out uh, tonight and, and ask for your input. What does that mean? What does that name mean to you? What's your understanding? When God said to Moses, I am who I am, say to the children of Israel, I am. Notice it's capitalized, it's deity, it's God. I am has sent me to you. Do you know what does, that, what does I am mean? What does I am who I am mean? What does that mean? And I want your, uh, some of your input there. I know it'll take a few moments uh, to get there, but we're looking at the great I am. And does anybody know even the Hebrew of that? It's made up of, I think, of, of four consonants, the actual I am, and it's actually one of the names that we do say of God. But, you know, it's, it's a big meaning. And so I want, I want to get some of your thoughts. Uh, Pastor Stowers has just asked the question. He hasn't given any answer on their feed there. What does the name I am mean to you? Uh, perhaps maybe I'll throw it to Pastor Stowers, see if he could just give me uh, a little bit of a thought. Pastor Stowers, what's, you're going to start us off. 
I'm going to say I agree with Pastor Elliot. But that question, uh, the, one of the aspects I am maybe, obviously, um, you know, we're talking about the deity, the divinity um, of God himself, of Jesus Christ. You know, I am, I always, uh, who is, who was, who is to come. Jesus claims that uh, one of the things he claims he always was. Um, you know, we are limited by, by time and space, but God is not limited uh, by what we're limited by. So that's one aspect of I am, uh, you know, always is, always was. Okay. Everlasting. All right, so thank you, Pastor Stowers. He started us off, and so we've got, uh, we've got Andrew. Uh, Andrew uh, says, no other name or lab- label could come close to describing God. That's very good, and actually... Uh, a number of commentators mentioned that very thought, Andrew, that there's no other name that could describe him. Uh, Mario says, all-encompassing. Uh, Jordan White's literally, I am or it is. And that's a little bit perhaps what uh, Pastor Stow was, was saying. Has anybody else got some input? So I want to say, um, uh, Werribee says, just I am. Ultimate authority, Manal. Uh, Alina says everlasting, forever present. Good stuff, Alina. Uh, Brittany says he who is and was in the Bible. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and has not changed. So Brittany's hit on a number of things. The unchangeable nature of God is one point, Brittany, right? And uh, that's definitely a definition of that. And the different tenses of God. The I am pastor mentioned that in the past, the present, and the future. So the expression of the unchanging, eternal being, a definition like Andrew says, nothing could fully express his nature. No other name can be attributed to him. And it includes all times, past, present, and to come. Ben David said, the existing one. And that's true as well, because one of the definitions is the I am, or we we say Yahweh is is the the Hebrew there, means that he had no other one to aid in his creation. See, we're all created by somebody, but God was self-existent. That's right, Ben. That's very, very powerful. Okay. So that's what we're looking at there. So now we see that this amazing God, so in the beginning of Genesis, we know he introduced himself as the creator. Uh, We understand that and we begin to see the increased revelation of God. Now here to Moses, when he's coming to birth a nation to deliver a people from under the power of Pharaoh and the devil we see the powerful revelation of uh, the same yesterday, today, and forever, the the existing one, the pre-existing, the present, and in the future, and no other name could describe Almighty God. And so James, at the end, he's taking what we see right at the end of the book of Revelation, where it says, Jesus says, uh, he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and... The end. Thank you, James. All right. So this God now reveals himself to a questioning Moses. Remember the opening illustration. You've got a toddler. There's a PowerPoint. It seems like the fork fits nicely into the PowerPoint. It seems unnatural in the child's mind. The parent says, no, 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 no. Don't go there. Right? The parent at that stage depending on the age of the toddler, you know, especially if it's really young, is not talking about electrons and electricity and, you know, invisible and shock and, you know, all those kind of things. He's just saying, keep away. Don't touch. Right? Isn't that true? This is a little bit of the understanding here. You know, God Almighty, the pre-existing one, now is with Moses, and he's talking to Moses, and he reveals himself as Yahweh, the great I am. But then in his graciousness, he also reveals himself to Moses in signs and wonders. 
at the burning bush. Let's have a look at Exodus 4. Uh, what is it? 2, 3, 4, Pastor. So the Lord said to him, what is in your hand? He said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it and it became a rod in his hand. Okay, and then six and seven. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, now put your hand in your bosom. And he put it, his hand in his bosom, bosom sorry, and went, sorry, when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And he said, put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again and drew it out of his bosom. And behold, it was restored like his other flesh. Okay, so first then we see in this text that God reveals himself. Part of this revelation of God here of the I am is his incredible power in supernatural signs and wonders. So that's number one. He shows himself to Moses. Number two, through the power of creative ability. See, Moses had some questions or concerns. He says, how can I be a deliverer how will they believe me? Signs and wonders, number one. Then he goes, well, but I'm not articulate. I can't speak well. I have a stutter. And so then let, let's see what God says there in Exodus 4, 11 and 12. So the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seen or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go and I'll be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. So here's God saying, this question, how can God use my life? I've got shortcomings. I don't have this physical ability or that skill. I'm not like that. And God, the almighty, pre-existing, all-powerful, says, I have the creative ability. If you want, I could make you the most articulate person on planet Earth. I could touch you. I could touch your mouth. I could help you. You say, well, I don't have much upstairs. You know, God could turn on some brain cells. You know, we need to pray that. Some people are, you know, forgetful, you know. They, it gets bad when we start forgetting our family's name. There will be people in our family. It's even worse if you forget your husband and wife's name. Amen. You say, God... Switch on some cells, can you say amen? See, God can do that. And, you know, we see that. Didn't he do that with Solomon? Solomon became the smartest, wisest man after God prayed. I want to I stretch your mind. Bold faith in a big God. So he answers them with creative ability personally. But then he also reveals himself through, uh, through pe the people that God gives to us. See, then he said, I'm going to send Aaron, your brother, and he's going to help you. Let's have a look. Exodus 4.14. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. God can give you people to help. God's calling you to something. God has something for you and I to do. And, you know, we've got questions about how can this done. So God sends supernatural help. Do you know one of the greatest helps that we have in doing the will of God is your local church? Thank God for all our churches. You know, I noticed, so, so there's numbers of churches. I've seen the people from, uh, I think I saw Bendigo, uh, Werribee, um, Burnside, Craigieburn, Footscray, you know, and beyond, I'm sure, that along your greatest aid, I mean, blessing. God brings people around in your local church to help you and I do what God's called us to do. What a great blessing that is. And finally, the final revelation here is the fear of God. I mean, because the Bible says eventually, uh, uh, God, uh, I mean, in verse 14, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Somewhere along the line, God's going to say, hey, listen, Yes, you've got questions. Yes, there's concerns. But listen, you just need to do right. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. See, so really, here's Moses. And if you see finally the motivation of Moses is, okay, I will go and do the will of God. 
I choose now to trust and obey God. I want to bring it to a last point tonight. And the last point is who's carrying who? Who's carrying who? What does that mean? In the book that we're doing, um, that we're basing our study on called Not God Enough by Gurria, he, he gives a statement here. He says, you can take one or two postures towards God. You can shrink God down and carry him or you can humble yourself, magnify the Lord and let him carry you. How big is our God? Isn't it a shame? You know, I talk to people on the streets. I talked to uh, a man from El Salvador uh, last Saturday and when we had that wonderful gospel march and he was in the civil war there and I asked, is there any special needs that you have? And he said he was shot. He, he could see a bullet wound through his stomach area there and he still had pain and difficulty. And I asked it, you know, him, do you believe in Jesus? And so what he did is he pulled out his necklace and he had a medallion of Jesus. I'm just carrying God around with me. But you know, that's a very small God, isn't it? If you can put God in a necklace or a cross or a medallion, the Bible, number one, tells us that we shouldn't do graven images. Number two, but that's very small. That's too small to meet your needs. If you can carry him around in your pocket or around your neck, your God's way too small. Can you say amen? See, if we consider this issue with the first two commandments of the Ten Commandments, Exodus, Exodus 23 and 4, Pastor. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Okay, so here's the first two commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. So first is about worshipping wrong gods. Worship God only, can you say amen? The true God, amen, the Father, the Creator. We believe in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and these three are one. We believe that Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. He is the pre-existing one. We believe in, in the incarnation, which is God became human flesh in Christ. We believe he's Emmanuel, which means God with us. So the first command is, you shall not worship wrong gods. But the second command, notice what it says, you shall not make for yourself carbon images in the likeness of heaven on the earth below or the water above the, uh, under the earth. So the second is about how you worship perhaps the right God, but in a wrong way. See, my friend with the medallion was possibly wanting to worship the right God, but in a wrong way. See, this is very old in history. We go back to Exodus 32, 1 through 6, the story when Moses is getting the Ten Commandments. Aaron and the people are down the bottom of the mountain. Let's see what happens. Uh, Exodus 32, 1 through 6. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. What I want to make a comment about that. Thank you, Pastor. Notice that statement, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. That word Lord there is the name for the true God. I want you to ponder that. What they're doing is Aaron down here is saying, we're going to make a golden calf, we're going to fashion it, then we're going to have a feast, and this golden calf is a representation or is the true God. So this is what Moses came down and says, people can worship the true God in a wrong way. 
And notice as soon as they did that, you know, the very next day they had a feast unto the Lord. They turned the lights down. They got the smoke happening, the strobe lights. They put on their skinny jeans, uh, tight shirts, uh, uh, crop tops for the women, and they just had a service. They played that beat. They uh, were relevant to the generation they were in. They had a nightclub experience. And before you know it, the Bible says they're in sexual sin. They're, they're in trouble. And they're, they're, they're trying to worship God, but they're worshiping him the wrong way. Right? So what, this is something that we're considering for a moment. Remember we talked about you either have a big God and he is who he says he is and he has the right to tell us how we approach him, how we worship him, how we follow him. And you might not understand all of it, but there's a dimension of trust. See, there's a story about Thomas Jefferson. He was one of the founding fathers of the U.S., and I believe is part of the writing of their constitution. He said that he loved Jesus and he loved the, many of the teachings, but he, he didn't like the miracles. He didn't like the miracles. He didn't believe in the supernatural miracles of the Bible. So he had his New Testament and what he literally did, he got a knife or scissors and cut out all the miracles in the Bible. He cut the verses out. How many know in the New Testament, that'd be a lot? So he just kept the good teaching of Christ and he took all the miracles. They actually still have his Bible in the Smithsonian Museum and you can see it today and it's all cut up. He just didn't like the miracles. He liked this, but he didn't like that. Do you know people can approach God and even Christianity like that? They cut this out. They take that out and they shrink God down and they carry him around, around their neck or in their pocket, a convenient God. But I want to tell you, that's not the big God that we see with Moses. I am who I am. Can I make a comment again? We made this in our first study. A God small enough to be understood is not big enough to deal with your problems. We're not going to understand everything about God. We're not going to understand. For some of our new Christians, we don't understand, well, why does God say that? And why, why this and why that? You, you look, you, I believe in teaching. You know, people, I want questions to be asked. But sometimes we've got to just trust and obey. And that's part of the revelation. I want to, I want to throw it open again to this question. I like, you know, the Thomas Jefferson thing. What have other people done? Thomas Jefferson didn't like the miracles. What have other people literally cut out? What have they cut out? What has Christianity cut out today of the Bible? What is the dangers of some of the modern churches? What have they cut out of their understanding? What do people no longer teach and preach about? That's an interesting question, isn't it? Pastor, can you give us something? Um, perhaps, you know, what do you know? Maybe some of the modern churches today, you just maybe give us something that, you know, that, that's been cut out. Maybe that's not talked about or preached about. What, what has been cut out today? I'm just thinking of something obvious, a certain massive church in the U.S., um, and I don't think the message of sin is preached on. Um, you know, that God has standards, uh, holy standards that we need to live by, even though we're in the New Testament. I hear a lot of people say, well, Jesus is love, Jesus is grace. Uh, the message of sin is, is not preached on. Okay. And so, you know, he, he's, been, he's been specific, well, unspecific. It's Joel Olston he's talking about. And, you know, um, and, and he, he's openly said, and the, the, the Christian world has condemned it. He said, look, I don't preach on sin and I don't preach on hell. Well, that's Thomas Jefferson, isn't it? And look, if every message is on sin and hell, that's an extreme too, isn't it? 
You know, there needs to be a balanced diet. But look, if you never preach on sin, Jesus preached on sin, you're not preaching the message of Christ. Christ's first message was repent, wasn't it? Repent from what? If you don't understand what sin is, how can you repent? Right? And so that's the danger. And look, so we had some other things here. David of Vistamay, repentance of sin. That's similar to what Pastor said. Brittany said speaking in tongues. Well, we've been doing adult Bible hour about powerful today. And one of those dimensions is speaking in tongues. Evangelism, tithe. Well, Brittany's got a lot. Tithing, belief in the rapture. That's been written out of some Pentecostal statements of faith. When they were charting the ACC Charter of Faith, one of the dimensions was the imminent return of Christ or the rapture was, was written out. So that, that's, a, that's a, a challenge. Uh, Laura, well, she says, altar calls for salvation. That's true as well. And so that's, that's becoming rare. Um, what does Jordan say? Uh, preaching, majority church, no conviction, feel good messages or just all inspirational. Well, you can get an inspirational message from a self-help guru, right? And look, I'm not saying that churches shouldn't inspire us. They should. But it's got to be more than that. Can you say amen? Um, is, is it, oh, is that Leighton, is it? Only the love of God's preached. And so, you know, uh, I couldn't. L810, okay, so... <laughs> Lay 10, okay. So the love of God. So um, then we've got salvation, the wrath of God. Uh, Brian said uh, uh, evangelism, uh, that Jesus is the only way. Jed, that's very good. And, you know, one of the, the, the areas of controversy, and look, I'll just say it, um, uh, Brian Houston of Hillsong said that Abba Father and, and Allah from Muslim are one of the same. That's wrong. They call it Chrislam, a, a blending of Christianity and Islam. I know it might be popular if you want to have a crowd, but it's wrong. It's wrong. Allah is not the same as God the Father. I'm telling you, it's, it's wrong. Okay, uh, Jed said the only way, so that Jesus is mutually exclusive of others. Uh, God's standard, uh, Jackie said, are now... You know, about judgment, and then Manal, motivational preaching, set of preaching of the truth. No one wants to offend anyone. Well, uh, listen, we don't go around, good on you, Manal, we don't go around purposely to offend, but sometimes the truth is offended. Winston Churchill said, I believe it was him who said, you know, I judge a people, I judge a person by who their enemies are. You know, if Adolf Hitler's your enemy, you're probably in a good place. If certain people are opposing you, then you're probably in a good place because you're probably on the right path. Can you say amen? So that's very, very good. Um, uh, Mario talks about uh, homosexuality. Swapna talks about that it doesn't fit into the modern lifestyles taken away. So, you know, we, we talk about, so all of those things need to have their place and not being imbalanced, but they need to have their place. And we shouldn't take the Bible, whether corporately or personally, and start taking scissors to it. Can you say amen? This is something very important. Amen. The Bible is the final authority. All right, so I appreciate what a great lot of input there. Karl Barth, and a theologian, makes this comment. If God does not make us mad, we're not worshipping him but ourselves. If our God never contradicts us and always likes what we like and hates what we hate, then he's not really God. All we've done is defined our preferences and called the personification of these things God. So what he's saying is, God has the right to sometimes ruffle your feathers. God has the right to call things as they are. And our plan is to get on his bandwagon, to follow him. People say, well, 
you know, my God's like a spare tire. I just pull him out when I have a flat. You know, he, instead of that, that wheel, that's a spare wheel, he should be the steering wheel of our life in the driver's seat. This is the revelation here. Can I ask you, is that true with your life? Is that true with your life? Have you shrunk God down so you can just carry him? Or have you humbled yourself and realized he's a big God and let him carry you? The great I am. This is what we've looked at. Powerful thought, isn't it? We just bring this to a close. This is our challenge. Are we following God on our terms or we're following it on his terms? This is what Moses had at that burning bush experience. You know, I pray regularly. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes. I pray regularly for people to have a burning bush experience. I pray that they have a Damascus Road experience where things change where you have like these of old, a revelation of who God is personally. God then revealed Moses through signs and wonders and through you know, divine help and people to help and all of those things through divine ability he can give us. He can do all those things for us. But the study is on the idea of a bold faith in a big God. And I want to challenge you as we just bring this to a close. The two first commandments is not to have any other gods before you. Are you not even worshipping the true God? Maybe you're an agnostic or atheist or maybe you've been in some other religion. God's challenging you to meet with him. And then the second question is, don't make graven images or other gods. What that's saying is don't worship God on your own terms. Worship God on his terms. He is the great I am. Let's bow our heads right where you are, in your, in your home, in your location. I want to give an appeal first of all. We've got just a couple of minutes. Perhaps there are people on the live stream and there's a lot of people Thank you for everyone joining us tonight. And I don't know the state of everybody's heart, but perhaps there are some that you're not right with God. And you know, and I, I preach, amen, I believe, I endeavor to preach the full gospel. The Bible says that we're all sinners and fallen short of the glory of God. Whether our sin is lying, selfishness, pride, sexual sin, theft, lust. The Bible says we're all sin and we all deserve judgment. And one day we're going to stand before God and we're going to have to give an account of our life. The Bible says that all our righteousness is like filthy rags. It's, you, on your own, we're not going to make heaven our home. That's why I talked about Jesus at the beginning of the study. He is the Saviour. He died on the cross. He rose again from the dead to forgive you, to offer forgiveness and eternal life. Maybe you're a backslider as well and you, you want my prayer. If you're unsaved, you'll backslide. Perhaps just in your house, just lift your hand. God will see that and I want to pray a prayer with you. Repeat these words. Say, Father in heaven, I turn from my sins. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. Shed his blood on the cross. But he rose again and is offering forgiveness and eternal life. I repent, turn away from my sins. I receive Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Let somebody know. If you're from one of our local churches, let your pastor know. Later on, uh, well, probably even now, we're going to have a, just a phone number of Pastor Stowers. Give him a text. But look, I want to just have a few moments. Pastor's going to sing a song with Bailey. 
perhaps God's spoken to you. Maybe this lockdown, you, you can have your experience with God. I know that God can turn evil for good. I'm praying that the church and the people of God don't lose momentum. If anything, we gain momentum. And perhaps in these moments, you can have your God moments, your Damascus Road experience, your burning bush experience, the great I am. He's a big God. He's a big God. Maybe there's needs that you need help from. Well, we can have faith in a big God tonight. Maybe God's spoken to you. There's things upon your life. Maybe there's unanswered questions. And you can bring them to God. And in the end, you can make a decision. God, like Moses, I trust and obey. Let's have the altar call. Pastor, would you sing that song? praise right now. Father, we thank you for your presence, the mighty Holy Spirit to come into every home of everyone represented here, God. You touch them, Lord. You are the great I am. You are the big God and we put our faith in you. Thank you, Lord God. Help us trust and obey in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank everyone uh, for being a part of us. We had an amazing uh, turn out. There's incredible numbers of people. Thank you so much. And look, uh, we don't know what the next number of days hold. Uh, I, I know we're going to be doing service this Sunday morning, Sunday night live stream. And if it's just seven days, then Wednesday, and hopefully we can be back after that. Pray with me uh, that this, this gets over quickly, that we can all be back together uh, in our churches and in our church here. So uh, looking forward to a good weekend. Uh, Sunday morning, we're going to start live streaming a little bit before uh, 10.30, so it'll come online probably 10.20 Sunday morning, and then uh, 10 to 6 Sunday night for our live stream services. Uh, God bless you. Uh, have a great night. Have some tea and coffee and a bit of fellowship now, and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you very much. God bless you. I was blinded, you gave me eyes to see I was going under, you reached out to me No, there's nothing you won't do To pick me up and pull me through Every hour, eight days a week, yeah
Money 